It has been a tradition for Mayor Reed to speak to the Atlanta Press Club at the start of each year. And we are honored to have him join us one last time as Atlanta's mayor. As Atlanta's mayor, please welcome Mayor Kasim Reed. Institute of Politics where I was a fellow. And so I went up last night, we took all these coats, and Chicago was as warm as it is in Atlanta. <laughs> Not a bit of snow on the ground. And so I said, uh, anybody that doesn't believe that we need to be acting decisively on issues related to climate, uh, I ought to wake up in Chicago and, and fly to Atlanta and see absolutely no difference. Um, what I thought about when I came today really is uh, just thinking about how important this visit is. Um, every single year that I have been mayor of Atlanta, I have come and addressed this distinguished group. And uh, in the car today, I was thinking about you all, and, and uh, folks that know me well know that I'm a huge fan of our 35th president. And I think his quote on the press is more appropriate right now than ever before. And uh, in an interview he did after the Bay of Pigs, uh, President Kennedy uh, says that the, the grading of the press is an, an invaluable check. The abrasive quality of the press applied to you daily, even though we never like it, and even though we wish they did not write it, it is impossible to have an effective democracy without it. I think that that's the appropriate way to, to start my remarks today, certainly given the fact that we're going to have the State of the Union address from the President right now. I don't think he would include that in his comments. <laughs> uh, even members of the press uh, need a hug. <laughs> Winston Churchill said it a little more elegantly. He said, a free press is the unsleeping guardian of every other right that free men, and I would add women, value. It is the most dangerous folk of tyranny. So what I'm going to talk about during my last address really is to give you a bit of a report out and then try to reserve as much time as possible so that we have the free-flowing question and answer uh, period, warts and all today. I appreciated the warts you put in my fine introduction. <laughs> but here's where we are right now. Uh, despite the fact that we're certainly uh, in the midst of the toughest period in my administration that myself and my team have ever gone through, uh, the city of Atlanta, uh, by every measure, is absolutely ascendant. I believe that we are winning the competition to attract talent and jobs into the city of Atlanta in a way that we have not before. Uh, in the last 42 months, uh, 17 companies have moved their regional and their national headquarters to the city of Atlanta in a manner that is flat out unprecedented. The amount of net job gains uh, during an eight year period is simply the highest that it has been in 40 years, meaning verifiable jobs that are coming in to the city of Atlanta. This has been largely led, but not only led, uh, by Bill Moody and NCR, which is moving 5,000 jobs with average incomes in, eight, in excess of $68,000 or more. <clears throat> to give you some context of that uh, commitment, 
It literally means that the NCR relocation will have an economic impact annually on the city of Atlanta in excess of $1 billion because having those folks come into the city of Atlanta five days a week is going to change our economy forever. For the first time in 25 years, the first 11 months of 2016, the city of Atlanta issued more than double the number of residential building permits than Gwinnett, Forsyth, or Cobb County, our fast growing suburban counties. Let me give you the numbers so that you can keep them with you. In the city of Atlanta, under Tim King's leadership, we issued 7,568 building permits. Gwinnett issued 3,753. For site issued 3,369, and our friends in Cobb issued 3,357. So people are choosing to bring and build their dreams and make the most significant investment of their lives right here in Atlanta, reversing an eight year trend where it was the opposite. Folks were choosing to move to the suburbs. Uh, last year, in 2015, uh, uh, we had a record level of construction in the city of Atlanta. It was $2.9 billion. All of you who are from here know uh, that the high mark in the life of our city was the Centennial Olympic Games. Um, this year, we will have $4 billion in new commercial construction. Real estate values have now uh, returned to the 2008 levels. And so we are really seeing a city where people are voting with their feet. <coughs> Business is voting with its feet by choosing to move here. And people are voting with their feet by choosing to buy their homes here. And if you look out of these beautiful windows in this beautiful space, um, you will really see it in action. Right after I leave here today, I'm going to limp over to Castleberry Hill, uh, where we'll be breaking ground on Castleberry Park, a $90 million mixed-use project that will include approximately 200, a 200-room 200 Hard Rock Hotel and 130 apartment units directly across from the new Mercedes-Benz Stadium. Funded in part by $4.2 million by a Westside TAD grant, approximately 20% of those apartments are going to be affordable, restricted to households earning 80% of the area median income. And so over the next year, we're going to continue to focus on affordability, and we're going to lay the groundwork to make it a part of the social fabric in the city of Atlanta. Because what is happening nationally is that there is going to be a housing shortage that drives up real estate values. So we have about an 18 month to 24 month window to act decisively in this space while real estate values are where they are. And so now the nation is in need of 500,000 more apartments and 1.5 million more homes. And so what we're going to do is we're going to focus harder on more approaches like the scattered site approach that we use near Turner Field that I think is one of the most significant things that we've accomplished because we moved away from the old public housing model where you had large complexes to, to build 68 new homes and renovate four new homes to allow people to rent them at rates between $900 and $1,500 per month for families, where they have their own yard, where they have their own driveway. And then after a 15-year period of time, those individuals <coughs> will have an opportunity to purchase those homes. Right now, we are working in partnership with the West Side Future Fund on a number of initiatives that will impact the West Side Corridor. The Atlanta Beltline today is in the best shape that it has been in. The threat of the sword of Damocles that was hanging over the head of the Atlanta Beltline 
preventing its ability to grow in the future has been removed. And as a result of the vote on the November 8th, we will be able to complete the right-of-way acquisition of the Atlanta <coughs> Beltline at a cost of about $66 million. And so as I stand here right now, the Atlanta Gulf Line has now attracted $400 million in a strong partnership from APS and Fulton County and the city of Atlanta, Mayor. And it has attracted $4 billion in private capital. And this year we'll have more than 1.5 million visitors and now has the first office building going right next to it by an entrepreneur who was involved in the original Pont City Market transaction. So an entrepreneur came out of Pont City Market, Jim Earl, and is now leading a project that will uh, attract another quarter of a billion dollars worth of investment not far from where we stand right now. A few years ago, my predecessor, Mayor Shirley Franklin, did an amazing job in the homelessness space led the Atlanta City Council and others to fund $22.5 million, $23.5 million in dollars for uh, the homelessness efforts, the homeless opportunity bond. And so many members in the philanthropic community and on the Regional Commission on Homelessness, led by Jack Harden, who gives all of his heart and his passion to this effort, they kept coming to my office and saying, you know, Mayor, you need to do more on homelessness. You're not doing enough, even though we had reduced it by 53%. And Kristen Wilson has been such an important part of that effort. And so you all know me. I said that if you meet me halfway, I'll meet you halfway. And Atlanta responded. And so the philanthropic community has raised 15 million hard with another 10 million to go, Carla. And then the city is going to go to the capital markets for $25 million, and we're getting ready to invest $50 million, the biggest investment ever, in eliminating homelessness in the city of Atlanta and making it rare and brief in the city of Atlanta. We have moved our veterans' homelessness in the city of Atlanta to functional zero where it is right now. But you know, we got to stay inspired. And the other day I was with Eric Garcetti, and Eric and I are really good friends, but we're also both extremely competitive. But we had a moment the other day, and I was listening to him. We were talking about how important this work is. And, and he and I both get the advice that, you know, the worst thing that you can do to about, to, uh, about homelessness is to talk about it publicly, because homeless people read too. If you do really well at it, they can get on the bus and train, get to your city too. But he told me the story that I wanted to share with you because it moved me. He told me the story about a dad that he met. And so there was a gentleman who he met in LA and the gentleman um, had served in Vietnam. And while he was in Vietnam, he and his best friends had served together. This gentleman was now homelessness, homeless. And so they were friends. And so when they were serving in Vietnam in the midst of the worst of the conflict, he said, if I don't make it back, Maria, I'd like for you to take care of my daughter. Well, both of them actually made it back. And so they lost touch. And so this gentleman actually became homelessness, homeless, Reese was living in the street. And he came across a young girl. And the young girl said her name, and she said, who is your dad? And when she said the name of her dad, he's like, I knew your dad. And she's like, well, my dad died of alcoholism, and as a result, I got put out of my house, and now I'm homeless. He cleaned himself up, and he cleaned her up, and he now is raising that young girl. Just Think about that promise for a minute. We're doing the very same thing for people in the city of Atlanta, right a, a few blocks away from here at the Imperial Hotel. I believe that Peachtree and Pond is going to come to a, a conclusion that I think satisfies everyone. I think the downtown corridor is going to be strengthened in a way that we cannot imagine 
when the people who are at Peace Street and Pine are able to be treated in facilities that are smaller and more concentrated and are working towards concrete results. All of that is occurring because under the leadership of Jim Beard and so many others in this room, and Yvonne Yancey, Kathy Hampton, and Candace Bird, uh, our team has moved to a position where it is today where we have the strongest credit rating that the city has had in 50 years. It is AA plus, it's rated by Standard & Poor's, Moody's, and Fitch. And the cash position of the city right now has moved from $7.4 million when I walked in the door to $153 million today. My goal, and I know that Jim's going to be upset, but you'll have to get over it. <laughs> My goal is to leave the city of Atlanta with $175 million in the bank for a rainy day. That will mean that we will have gone eight years with balanced budgets, unprecedented job growth under Eloisa Clemente's leadership. We will have reduced crime by 30 points under Chief Shields' leadership, which is where the crime numbers are today, although we're working hard to reduce the spike in murders that we have seen. And all of these things we would have accomplished uh, together. That said, uh, because of the uh, bribery scandal and the indictments related to it, we will have to work very hard to stay focused at a time when the people have given us maximum support. And so that's what I'm trying to ask my team to do today. Because the fact of the matter is, We've got $6 billion in capital programs at Hartsville-Jackson Airport, the most successful airport in the world that must proceed. We have secured a future with Delta, a 20-year lease. I was with Tom Donahue and Governor Nathan Deal yesterday talking to the Georgia Chamber of Commerce. We have a 20-year lease with Delta with a 10-year option. Maria, that is the second longest Delta lease since Mayor Hartsville signed the lease with Sea Woman keeping the largest private employer in the state of Georgia, in the state of Georgia, headquartered here for another 30 years, which helps the Metro Chamber, which is upstairs in this building. If you haven't been by, go see it. Halo's got so much flair, it's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> go out and win more. The city of Atlanta is now in the top 10 in the United States of America in foreign direct investment. We will continue to improve there. And the work that we're doing in the technology sector, I think, is the true untold story of why our city is thriving in so many sectors. In partnership with the Atlanta Committee for Progress, we raised $15 million for early stage funding in the technology sector and in the fintech sector, where we process 70% of all credit card payments in the world on Collection Alley between here and Alpharetta. <coughs> so all of these things have been accomplished since January 4, 2010. The new Mercedes-Benz Stadium will open this year, and it is going to be the best sports facility in the world, excluding no one, including Jerry's World. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all got to go see it. It's going to be amazing. And so, you know, my message today is, is that we need to keep pushing. That we need to uh, accept the Justice Department's investigation as something that is doing the city a favor. Because if there is a problem with our process, we need to know it. We need to get to the bottom of it. And we need to punish any individual involved in wrongdoing. But I'll tell you what I'm not going to do. I'm not going to let the last seven years of work that we have done to move Atlanta to a position that it simply has not been in be thrown out of the window because of it. And nor should you. This isn't just about me and my tenure as mayor. I'm going to be fine. This is about what all of us have built together. And so that really is our challenge at this moment in time. But I have no doubt standing here today 
that as we have met so many challenges before, we're going to face it and we're going to come through it and we're going to be better because of it. And when we're done, we will have done, achieved what I set out to do, which is for the city of Atlanta and our community to be considered among the leading cities of the world. A couple of weeks ago, I went to the Dubai World Government Forum to talk about the accomplishments that we have had in the city of Atlanta. So it's not just in the United States, Stephanie. All over the world, people are looking at what Atlanta is doing, achieving multiple progress along lines of excellence. So it's right there in front of us, you all. And we cannot let what we are going through right now throw away everything that we worked to accomplish in the past, because it's not just about the, the current seven years, it's about the last 10, 20, and 30 years of progress. And so I got up this morning at 5 a.m., happily went to the airport, got on my Delta plane, knowing that I was coming home to meet the press. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? I wouldn't have it any other way. Because even on the toughest days, I got my dream. My dream was to be the mayor of the city of Atlanta since I was 13 years old. And the dog caught the car. <laughs> and so my wish to all of you is that the next mayor can keep selling out. Because I think every one of my events has been to sell out for the press club of Atlanta, <laughs> doing my job to support tremendous journalism at its highest level. Uh, and always, even in our toughest times, I'm appreciating the work that you do, and uh, in not as profound a manner as President Kennedy said, Kennedy said it, uh, but understand that uh, we wouldn't be the community that we are without you. We need you, and we appreciate you. God bless you. And uh, now, I'll take any question that anybody has. Dave. Mayor, despite the accomplishments that you just mentioned, how concerned are you that the bribery investigation will overshadow or tarnish your legacy? Well, you know, I think that if you look at almost every administration, you hit it, you have tough patches. I mean, I could go through them, but I'm not. Um, you have touch pa tough patches. And I consider that, and I know that the record is going to be that at, at every step along the way, we fully cooperated. That's what you can do. But I'll tell you what the record isn't going to be. It's not going to be that we stop working. Right? If you look at what we have in front of us, we have somewhere on the order of about $14 billion in projects that need to proceed for my successor. But more than for my successor, for this community and this region. We got the largest expansion of MARTA in its history, 2.6 billion. <coughs> that needs to move on and and, and uh, be and, and be successful. You've got the work at the airport. You've got the Renew Atlanta bond where we're cutting the infrastructure backlog in half. And so I'm going to let you all do what you need to do to me. That comes with the territory, right? So you're going to do what you do. But what you all don't report is the fact that since I've been mayor. As much stuff as you all have had to say about me, I've remained pretty popular with the people that put me in office the whole time. You don't report that, though, right? If you go year in and year out, in my worst days as mayor, the overwhelming majority of the people of Atlanta who put me in this office supported me. And you all don't talk about that. The low point in my time as mayor has been a job approval rating at around 61 or 64. So you all are going to do what you need to do. You're going to report vigorously. 
and I'm going to get up every single day and do my job. But let me tell you something. I'm going to leave with my integrity intact. What I would ask you to do is uh, just to be more diligent about uh, folks um, who are not me. I expect you to do whatever you're going to do to me. But, you know, there are other folks that really don't have this coming. So that's my answer to your question. Anybody got anything else? Yes. Uh, you, have this, uh, you want to have affordable housing in Atlanta. Are you familiar with the state facility over on Ponce across from the, uh, the Grady Hospital? Pullman well, Yards. There's a great big area there that I think would be do well for an L-shaped facility for family low-income housing. Is there any chance that could happen? Um, there is, if you hadn't asked that question. <laughs> but it is impressive, man. <laughs> Here's the deal. Um, Atlanta is the largest real estate owner in the city of Atlanta, aside from the state. The only impediment to afford affordable housing achievement is will, right? We've got a city that's 131.5 square miles. And through the city of Atlanta, through the Atlanta Housing Authority, and through the Atlanta Land Bank Authority, as long as we are committed as a community, then we will have opportunities for affordable housing. The reason I've been talking about it so much is that I'm trying to persuade all of you, the people who will shape the city and the region for the next decade and 20 years, for us to make affordable housing cool and to make it a part of our social ethic and for us to come to the conclusion that Atlanta is better off by having a broad array of people who live in, who can live in it, and by making sure that millennials can afford to live in it. And right now, um, we had an amazing reset, but if you look at the real estate bust around 2008, 2009, we weren't focused on affordability at all. And so after that crisis, I think that we have the opportunity for a reset. And so that's why I'm trying to push so hard now that we're in a financial condition to really play. But the site um, that you have spoken about is at the top of my mind. But uh, through our relationship uh, with the state, um, we've acquired other very attractive parcels of land at very reasonable rates, including uh, land for the Atlanta Dolphins. Yes. Mayor, which of the candidates running for, to succeed you do you think comes closest to sharing your vision, your perspective? <laughs> well, that was good. <laughs> Not this important. Um, yes, <laughs> I think you've got, um, I think you've got, you know, Making, making a marriage just like making bacon in this time. <laughs> Only thing that's going to happen is you're going to get out a big frying pan like your grandmama used to have. You're going to lay out bacon. And if you're cooking for somebody, you love it when the bacon, it, all of you all are going to generate the heat that melts the fat. <laughs> and I don't know what's going on in this time. But when I was running from there, me and Darren, we ran, we ran for two years. You all were on us. I mean, the number of times that you reminded me that I was at 3% <laughs> in the year before the election was so bad that we couldn't even watch Channel 2. <laughs> so, it was, I mean, it would kill the office. I mean, it was like we would take lunch when the news came on. <laughs> so I think that you've got, you know, half a dozen serious candidates. I'm not there yet. I'm going to wait and let the process play out. I'm just stunned by the campaigns that the folks are running. Stunned. When I ran, we had our exploratory committee in February of 2008. We had campaign offices fully mobilized, full campaigns. Right now, you've got a bunch of candidates. We just had a poll come back, uh, what was it there the day before yesterday? You got a bunch of candidates at a nine, five, four, Three, two, which is zero, because that's within the margin of error. <laughs> and you got you got an election in November. So I don't think that anybody has anybody 
has gotten to the point where they have identified themselves as serious because nobody's really cracking 12 or 11. So um, I think that uh, we're just going to keep watching the process play out. And then you all will burn away the people um, that shouldn't be in the race. Y'all haven't even gotten started yet. Y'all been so busy with us. Wait, <laughs> wait for somebody to shed his heat. <laughs> I mean, we didn't have the crisis about the letter that you're dividing black people and you need to quit. And I mean, that was just, I mean, goodness gracious. I don't know. But maybe somebody just gets to sashay into being there. It all will show up, though. It's going to be unpleasant. I've been through it. So, but I think we had a decent, a decent field. I'm, I'm not. Uh, I'm not uh, really prepared to say more than that, except that, um, that I think uh, Vincent Ford is a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, come on now. Don't do the ooh. The man is talking about me every chance he can get. So y'all at least, y'all got to gotta have some fairness today. I've been holding my Jesus cross under my suit. <laughs> Wrong as the day is long. <laughs> Y'all know he is. In the back with the blue shirt. Man, What's happening? I think I saw Vincent Ford outside doing this way. Vincent Ford would never do that way for me. <laughs> Just say, I want to take and one thing y'all know, I do this for a living. <laughs> so I don't I don't do it. You you don't Y'all know when y'all come to me, I mean, it's... <laughs> this all might go a lot faster for you, the heat that you're talking about, if maybe they can put those documents online. Is there any reason behind the delay being... No, I mean, here's the deal, Keith. I mean, I, I, I really thought y'all got it wrong in that regard. I went to the AJC editorial board. I explained myself in detail. Here's the deal. Um, we had, when we went through a similar amount of scrutiny with Hartsville Jackson Airport, we produced 2 million documents and 500,000 emails in the old city council chambers. That's a very hard process. We were getting multiple open records requests and we were trying to cooperate with the Justice Department. And so we were getting really harsh stories on open records when I have been very aggressive in responding to open records and have supported open records throughout my entire career. But there was a real concern, if you use the electronic redacti redaction model, that innocent people's information would be put out and that you needed to be more thoughtful. Now, I know that some folks said, well, you know, everybody has a Twitter speed mentality. When we turned over the documents to justice, Kathy, don't faint, <laughs> we turned them all over, unredacted. So it's not like it was that simple. And so we've had an, a third party law firm working to produce these documents. And then you all had all these jokes and tweets saying that some of the documents were blank. That's not true. They, had, they were only blank because they had slides that did not transfer well. But the fact of the matter is, is we didn't look at those documents before we turned them over. Because if we had looked at them and seen blank pages, then what would you all have said? They looked at them before they turned them over to the press. So we turned them over at the exact same time you got them. And so now we're working diligently to provide them to you in electronic form. But we didn't think that we were going to get hammered by doing what we did previously. But technology just moved on us. And people had a higher demand at a faster pace. So that's what's going on. But this notion that we didn't want to produce a document, that's not, that's not the case. The, the 1.4 million documents that we produced <laughs> were what we had provided to the Justice Department. And we opened those boxes at the exact same time you all did. So that's what happened. And um, you know, these stories I thought had been really unfair. 
The other story that I thought was extremely unfair was the headline from our paper of record that said the FBI had raided City Hall. That's just factually not true. It's not what happened at all. No one, no, no, the FBI did not raid City Hall. The Justice Department contacted our office. They briefed our attorney. And a plan, was, a plan of action was laid out that I can't discuss. But no one raided City Hall, and that was the headline of our paper. That's not right. And so, you know, the point I'm making in all of this is I think that there are a lot of reasons, bad and good, that you may feel what you feel about me, but we have a city that's doing pretty amazing things, and I'm going to be out of office in about 10 or 11 months. And I think the city and all of the things that it's accomplished needs to, to thrive. And the people who are engaged in wrongdoing are going to be caught, punished, and convicted. What else is there to do but that right now? You can't reform the system because if you implemented a system of reform right now, you may interfere with active matters. I stood in City Hall and answered every single question from every reporter who asked me a question, no matter how offensive it was to me. On video. And so that's what I think. Anybody have anything else? Um, yes, I got Maria next and then the woman in the back. Okay. Um, I want to thank you for being a green mayor and uh, we're doing a lot. I think part of what makes Atlanta so beautiful is our trees, and we've got a great tree ordinance. We've got great companies like South Face and Turner Foundation protecting the environment. But I'm worried that in a few weeks we might be tearing down the Georgia Dome and paying to haul it to a landfill when it's still a great functional facility that benefits our city and it's paid for. Would you consider a deal where the city buys the Georgia Dome from the state for a dollar? They can save the, the demolition cost, and we can continue to host 350 events a year that we've been hosting, like Georgia State graduation and Beyonce, and maybe even host another Olympics. Yeah, I like you too much uh, to play with you. The Georgia okay. Dome is going to be imploded, and it's going to be t uh, carried away. And I'm not going to interfere with the Georgia World Congress Center's process. Um, we have some pretty exciting plans for that space. I think that at the end of the day, you will be very satisfied with what comes in place of the Georgia Dome. But um, I can't share them uh, because we're not ready to share them yet. But I think that overall, everyone here is going to be thrilled with our plans. Regarding uh, what, we're done, what we've done in the green space, uh, we're moving faster in terms of making our city more sustainable, once again, than I've seen. I mean, Stephanie Stucky Denfield has been it's an absolutely amazing leader. The city of Atlanta was selected as, a, as one of uh, the Rockefeller uh, Foundation's 100 Resilient Cities effort. Um, I've got uh, John R. Seidel, who's now running uh, my sustainability efforts in the city of Atlanta. Um, we passed a sustainability ordinance that said if you've got a 25,000 square foot commercial building, you need to start reporting out on energy efficiency. We're the number one city in the United States of America for the Better Buildings Challenge, more than 100 million square feet under the Better Buildings Challenge. We're launching the PACE program. We're launching the largest solar program of any municipality in the state of Georgia. We're launching the largest electric vehicle fleet of any municipality in the state of Georgia. We just launched the first 100 uh, electric uh, charging spaces at Hartsville Jackson Airport with another 100 coming online. and. Uh, we hosted the board of directors of the Sierra Club just the other day. So we are moving. We have to figure out a way to cool the planet by two degrees. We have to figure out a way to keep the climate from rising by a degree and a half. We just have to do it. We have five more minutes for questions. Okay. Maria. Um, I will have a couple here. That's you always do. <laughs> uh, the first one, looking back over your seven years, what have you learned? What, what are things you wish you had done differently uh, and through this process? I know any experience like this is a learning process. And I wonder if you could share with us some things that uh, if you could do a do-over, you would do a do-over. Um, I think that I would. Uh, uh, go, yeah. You can answer this one and then I. I think that I would spend 
I think that I would spend more time um, with folks working on the relationship even once we achieved our result. So, you know, there's a reason that you have term limits. Being mayor of a major American city requires a certain amount of force of will. And so on the other side of that force of will, uh, it can often leave hard feelings and it can often lead fractured relationships. And so if I were doing my job over today, I would spend more time on what happens after the goal is achieved, um, you know, really hearing the other side out and, and trying to, to be a little more caring. But I think that, you know, when you become mayor, you understand that there is a, 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 there is a finish line and a wall. And so I think that in your zeal to accomplish things that, you, that you've had in your mind, since you were a kid, that you can be um, tougher, not that the moment requires, but it doesn't have to be permanent. And so that would probably be the, the change uh, that I would make, um, the lesson that I would learn. And I, and I, you know, I think there are a lot of things that influence that. Uh, I think you know, my daughter has a big influence on me, my wife has a big influence on me. I'm a much better person today than I was when I got elected mayor at 40 years old. Just a different person. I'm more patient. Uh, I think I'm just a better man. <laughs>